We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So so what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. you also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Dateable Podcast, where we examine people's behavior when it comes to dating, love and relationships and sex. We can't (laughs) forget about sex. And today's episode is diving into happiness. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And Julie, just right now on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most happy you've ever been, what would you rate your happiness at? I would say... I'd say like an eight. I'm pretty happy right this minute. How are are you you feeling? What's your happiness level? I'm at a constant seven. Seven is my default. So today I'm at a default seven. Nice, nice. And we, yeah, we dive into happiness. We are super excited about this episode. It's with Rob Mack, who is a celebrity happiness coach. And he really just takes us through, you know, what happiness means, his own personal journey, and, you know, the inevitable question of do relationships make you happy? So why are you at an eight? Why am I at an eight? You know, I mean, (laughs) I think things in life are lining up right this minute. So there's that piece just overall. But I'm also at an eight because it's Halloween weekend and Halloween weekend makes me happy. (laughs) (laughs) for anybody who has been listening to dateable since the beginning you should know that julie loves halloween and it's a very important holiday for her (laughs) and last year was so sad because nobody celebrated so what do you have a costume this year or did you probably be like a nine tonight 
when I'm out, oh. you know? Might be a 9 or a 10. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so I was thinking about costumes, and I do have a costume. My boyfriend and I are doing a couple's costume. So cheesy. Love Always it. Always good. And we made it last night, or we attempted to make half of it. And we are going to be, only people in San Francisco might get this, but we'll, I'll fill people in. We're going to be Carl the Fog <laughs> and Carla the Fog, because Carla has taken over for Carl. So for Ooh. anyone not in San Francisco, San Francisco is known for fog and it's got it its own identity through what everyone calls Carl. And there was a Twitter account that Carl would say mm-hmm. really funny things about just the layer of fog that persists over San Francisco. So how do you dress up as fog? So we I, so we <laughs> made these big clouds out of styrofoam. And we have like um, a name tag on them. And then we have the Twitter quotes, all the funny sayings that they both say. And it made me think about it because I feel like in my 20s, Halloween was just an excuse to dress super slutty. Slutty. And now I'm thinking about it. I'm about to go to a Halloween party tonight in a giant styrofoam in the shape of a cloud like how unsexy is that (laughs) well also because you're in a relationship and also i'm sure you were thinking what is most comfortable (laughs) yeah but i'm not sure how comfortable i mean are my unders gonna be comfortable but wearing the big cloud might not be that that's true but you will be socially distanced (laughs) yes i will i will be socially distanced on purpose that's a good one. I think that's a great couples costume. We love couples costumes <laughs> because because they're they're funnier when you're together, but when you're apart, nobody gets it. Like <laughs> they're like what what are you supposed to be? Uh we are Travis Barker and Courtney Kardashian. Oh, okay. My partner bought a bunch of temporary tattoos. He already has a bunch of tats, but he has he bought a bunch of temporary tattoos and put it on his neck. And he definitely looks more recognizable. I'm just dressed in all black and being bitchy. <laughs> I need to be honest with you, UA. I saw your photos on Instagram. You didn't and know. I had no idea what yeah. you were. I thought maybe Travis Barker because of the tattoos, but mm-hmm. no offense to your boyfriend, he looks nothing like Travis Barker. <laughs> Actually, so we went to, we dressed up the weekend before and we went to a party. And when we walked in, uh, it was like kind of a costume party. Okay. And people kept commenting about his cool tats like they thought this one guy was like you just look like every cool bro in in LA those are some cool tats and let me tell you Julie these tats are so random we got tigers we've got fire butterflies like random shit and people were admiring his fake tats and we're like did you know he's Travis Barker nobody nobody got the connection also because it was two weeks before Halloween right but I think that that's even better that nobody thought he was in costume and I'm just dressed in all black like nobody knows that I'm in costume either. Well, I think people are hard to pull off. Like my boyfriend and I were looking at couples costumes and a lot of them were like celebrities. Yeah. Unless you really look like that person, it's very hard to pull off. It has to be a very distinct costume. Yeah. Like yep, Britney, exactly. and Britney and Justin that one year in yep. all denim. That's very recognizable. Otherwise, you're just dressed in regular clothes and acting extra bitchy. I guess that's all you really need to do. But as things progress, I feel like this year was a little bit of a struggle. I'm not normally making like my Halloween costume the day before Halloween. I feel like every year that goes by, I get a little less enthused. So for that purpose, I feel like you just being able to throw something on and be able to do shit, that's always worth it. Yeah, it's so much fun to get creative. And I like it when people do costumes that aren't off the shelf. Yeah, I like making homemade costumes. So okay, so why are you at a consistent seven with happiness? I feel like I'm just, you know, my name in Chinese means happy. So I feel like I was just born default happy. And I have these outside ranges of like, I get to an eight sometimes and I get to a five or six, but seven is just my normal state. I feel like I'm very lucky to be Mm -hmm. where I am. I feel very lucky to have the people around me and my dogs make me feel sevens all the time that helps <laughs> so that's why i'm at a seven but there are very few things that can get me to an eight believe it or not interesting yeah so i guess the question for you since mm-hmm. we're like the big debate of this episode is you know does being in a relationship play into your happiness mm-hmm. what would you say from your past experience I feel like being in a relationship helps me understand different dimensions of happiness. Mm. So it opens up another level of happiness, but it also makes me 
appreciate the happiness I already have. Mm -hmm. What about you? I think I'm happy in different ways. Mm. I think it's not one is better than the other. But I think like, for instance, when I was single, I feel like I did more things that were like Mm self-fulfilling. And also, you know, I mean, I definitely still hang out with friends and stuff, but it was different when you're single. So I think Mm -hmm. there was a lot of happiness with that side of things. And then with a partner, you know, like having your go-to person and like confidant and activity buddy and person to like do whatever with I think that brings another side of happiness and being exposed to things like I feel like I do a lot more outdoor activities with my Mm -hmm. partner than I would do on my own and that brings me great happiness so I think there is some of that as well and then sex I think sex helps with happiness (laughs) (laughs) consistent sex (laughs) fucking hope so (laughs) that would really suck if you're like sex makes me unhappy (laughs) that would be a terrible state to be in I like this conversation we have with Rob though because you'll see I mean we're so dependent on other people for our own happiness I've been there and I remember just being feeling miserable because of receiving a text or because of something a guy did. And mm-hmm. now I realize this is so independent of my happiness. And you'll see after this, this episode, you'll understand you control your own happiness. Absolutely. But I think like, you know, humans are wired to go through life together. Mm. You can definitely have happiness and solitude for sure. I think Mm -hmm. there's been moments that I've been by myself. I'm thinking about if I'm in the hot springs in Calistoga myself, I am freaking so happy. But I think if I had no human connection... I think there is something about being connected to other people. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be a romantic relationship. But I think having relationships in your life is a key to happiness. I think, though, you can never rely. It needs to come with within. It can't just be this, like, if you have a friend, let's say, that's busy, for instance, it can't be that you're miserable because someone can't hang out with you. Yeah. And this is why we always say you can work on personal development all you want, but it has to be relational to other people too. You can't do this stuff in a bubble. And I read the stat the other day that people who feel socially connected are 70% less going to be depressed or anxious because they feel socially connected. I hope I said that right, but that makes sense to you, right? (laughs) It sounded good. It sounded like a legit stat, but I think that's actually a good point because that doesn't mean single versus in relationship. Mm -hmm. There was a book that um, Eric Kleinenberg that also co-wrote with Aziz Ansari. He was the co-author of Modern Romance. He wrote a book. Nobody remembers him. I know a a book about being single, like single, like people, like that more and more people are living on their own this day and age. And he said that he's a sociologist. Like he studied that single people are actually go out more often, are more engaged with Mm. their communities, are more social overall. Not to say that if you're in a relationship that means that you're sitting home every Friday night watching TV and that's it mm-hmm. but overall it doesn't always correlate that if you're in a relationship you have more social activity yeah. it's just different social activity yeah we're also multi-dimensional so it's other people who can bring out the different dimensions in who we are otherwise we're just that one person by ourselves right so it's interesting I think sometimes when you're single, I feel like there's more of a push to do things. Yes. You're more motivated. You're more motivated for sure. It's like one is that you'll meet people, but two, it's you don't want to be in that single stereotype of just staying in and doing nothing all the time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think sometimes it can be nice to be in that stereotype. I do miss free time a little, but I think overall, single people, there's a misnomer that single people are just like, sitting home with their three cats. And okay, yes, I agree. And that's why, you know, we gotten this question before, when do you know you're too comfortable Mm -hmm. being single? And I think that's when you're too comfortable is when you are cut off from society, Mm -hmm. and you rather stay in and be alone the majority of the time. Yeah, I don't know, though, because I feel like some of the times before I've met someone, it's when I have made a little space for them. I'm not saying I, I'm I'm definitely not a homebody. I'm not even now in a relationship. I'm always like asking friends to do stuff still and just bringing my partner now. But there was a period that I was go, go, go all the time that I didn't really have room for another person. Mm. And when I kind of, you know, stopped going out and doing as many things, and that just came with age and life stage. It wasn't because, you know, of single status or whatever. I do think 
think it kind of like brought me to a place that I was ready to let someone into my life. So while I don't think you should ever put your life on hold, I do think there is the flip side of it of not having enough time to include anyone. Like we all know those dates with people that just are always too busy. You can't make time to date. Like how can you make time for a relationship? So then that question is when you are choosing to stay home by yourself, are you avoiding something Mm -hmm. or are you welcoming something? If you're staying home, yeah, welcoming that feeling of being alone and working on yourself. Perfect. But if you're avoiding (laughs) facing some of those issues, that is a problem. I think a lot of it's like, what is the intention behind it? You know, like, because I think a lot of people will say like, I have a full life, I'm single, I've developed a full life. But is it because you genuinely love your life? Or is it because you've come to the conclusion you're never going to meet someone? Even though it's the same outcome, it's two different mindsets. Yeah. Okay, well, perfect segue into (laughs) our question. Because the question is, how do you know when you're in a good mental state to date? Mm, Perfect segue. (laughs) And this episode is all about that. But we'll just give you a little teaser into it. I believe you're in a, a good mental state to date is when you are at a place where you feel like your cup is full. And we've talked mm-hmm. about this before. What does it mean to feel like your cup is full? You feel fulfilled. You can be at a default happiness when you wake up and you're not dependent on other people to make you mm-hmm. happy. Your mental state is not dependent on other people's words or actions. I think when you're you have a life that you want to share with someone else versus mm. on depending on someone for a life. Those Mm. are a very different statement. And I think making room for someone still means that you have a life. It's just that you want to bring someone into that life opposed to being in the state of just go, go, go in only my way, etc. But back to that example of staying in on a Saturday night, are you doing it because you have absolutely no one to call and Mm. or you're avoiding social activities? Or is it coming from a place that you want to have a night of kind of master dating and self love? and pampering yourself and kind of taking that reflection time. Those are very different states. And kind of the first one is that you're relying on other people to build a life where the second is that you have that life and you're just recharging from it. I am obsessed with that distinction. That makes so much sense to me because either you have such a freaking badass life, you can't wait to share it with someone else because you're like, come, come check out what I've been (laughs) up to. Or you're waiting for someone to show you the life that you want to have. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference. We hear this in our community as well is I'm fine being alone, but I just feel like I could do so much more when I get into a relationship. Well, that's not really the case. You can't wait for your future self to do all the things that you want to be doing today. Yeah. And I think one of the benefits of a relationship is that it exposes you to new things and new ideas, Mm -hmm. new hobbies, etc. But that doesn't need to be the only way you can expose yourself to that. I remember when I was single, I would find like different classes I could take all the time, whether that was virtual or in person. If anything, I wish I could get a little more of that back integrated into my life. So I think you can find that just in a different way. And it's coming from within without relying on someone else. And then when you meet that other person, that's just another way to get that stuff into your life. I distinctly remember my time in New York. I was in my late 20s and my career is not going well. I didn't have the support system. I was so far away from my parents. And I started dating this guy who on the days he called or texted me, I was ecstatic. I thought I could do anything. I thought I was invincible. And on the days it was crickets from him, I would be in my bed, unable to get out and eating ramen under my Mm -hmm. covers. And looking back on that moment, I see that because my life was not where I wanted it to be, I put my entire existence on someone else. I can relate to that so hard. Like I remember times I was just anxiously waiting for someone to text me back. And I remember one of my best friends would be like, I think it's because you have too much downtime, like at Uh, work and stuff that you're thinking about it so much. Because when you're busy, mm -hmm. you automatically just don't get as hung up on things because you are doing shit, right? But when you have all that idle time, what else are you going to do? You're going to wait by your phone and hope that someone can turn around your day. Yeah. So back to this question question, Julie, do you think that you have to have 
a perfectly fulfilling life first before you can start dating? Or is this something that you can just learn along the way? I don't think it's ever going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I think there is a balance that we've talked about before, too. It's if you have, okay, let's, we'll use the cup analogy. Mm -hmm. If you have like a a splash at the bottom, and Mm -hmm. that's it, then it's probably not a good time to date. You do need to do the self work to build yourself up. But if you're like 50 to 75% of the way there, so many people are always waiting for things to be perfect, Mm. or to be, you know, in that ideal state. But the reality is you're going to be waiting for Ever. So I think there needs to be a time that we grow through other people as well. Mm. And it can't just be until that magic day. It's kind of like the analogy of like, when I lose 10 pounds, I'll date again. But mm-hmm. then when you lose the 10 pounds, you're probably going to want to lose another 10 pounds. So it is a spiral that can be tough to get off of if you're always waiting for that perfect day. But I do think if you're at a place of really low water or low energy in that glass, then I, I think that there probably needs to be more of an emphasis on the self-love and therapy and the work that goes into it. And I'm going to add a little bit to that analogy. It's also the movement of the water. It's the water still. You could be Mm. almost halfway there, but is it just staying Mm. still? Or are you actively looking to fill your cup, even if your water level may be low right now? And I think a good mental state for dating is that you're actively looking to fill your cup and know that that is your goal. And you can take someone along with you for the ride. Right. I think we need to expect that like, we're not perfect. And our partners aren't going to be perfect either. And we can be imperfect together. But it can't be two people that are broken, just clinging on to each other to become unbroken. So there is a distinction between the two for sure. Yeah, that's what you get when you get two broken people is that you end up hurting each other. Mm -hmm. The broken pieces. Okay, Mm -hmm. enough analogies. That's it. (laughs) Answering that question. We got to get on to the happiness, right? Right. You know what makes me happy? Our Instagram account. Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll go into some announcements. So at Dateable Podcast, you can connect with us through Instagram. You know, we put up a call for guests just the other day on Instagram. Of, mm-hmm. Do you want to be on an exit interview with some of your yes. exes to learn what really went down? Yes. Do you want to be on a 24-hour date? We've already got some submissions mm-hmm. in. We're still trying to find a good match, though. We don't want to just be like, you live in San Francisco, you live in San Francisco, go. We want to have a little more thought that goes into it. So if you're interested in being guests on either of those dating experiments, Mm -hmm. definitely reach out to hello at datablepodcast.com or DM us on Instagram. Also, there was a call out for toxic femininity. Mm -hmm. That's a topic that we wanted to do really badly. So if you are an expert in this space or you just have a stance on it, I think in this, we'd love to hear from a woman because it could go sour if we're doing toxic femininity with a man. No offense, men, but you you get it. Uh, so what was the other one? Was it just that one or was there one and more? And then infidelity. Yes. Have you cheated? Yes. Have you been the cheater and you have a strong stance on cheating? Either way, we love to hear from you too. Yeah, we love sourcing from our community. Mm-hmm. We have an upcoming episode next week all about dating with disability that came from a member, so Tiffany, good. in our community. So good. It really tugs on those hard strings and it goes, I think it's very relatable for everyone, even if you don't have a disability. But I love pulling from people from our community. So definitely follow us. Make sure you're in the po- the Dateable Podcast Facebook group, Love in the Time of Corona. That's where we post this as well. And then Sounding Board is our premium members. Again, PSA, mm-hmm. if you want to join the Sounding Board, make sure to go to datablepodcast.com slash Sounding Board and sign up. Ooh. Or then you'll get admitted into the Facebook group. Yes. So I don't want to ignore people that have accepted it, but it's, it is way easier if you just sign up and we can get you in. Yes. And if you want to see our lovely faces, YouTube, that's where to go. Dateable podcast on YouTube. Yep. We're in some nice fall foliage today. So pumpkin. We're in pumpkin attire. Oh yeah. We're matching today without without color uh, arranging it ahead of time. That's all the stuff you can see on YouTube. Okay. (laughs) Let's get into (laughs) a few messages from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by First Leaf. If you're a wine drinker, you already know that the selections are endless, which is why finding a wine that you like can be hit or miss. I'm sure we've all been there, walking up and down that wine aisle, trying to pick out a bottle, but we have so many other better things to do with our time. Now that I'm a First Leaf Wine Club member, I don't have to worry about the wine selection process. First Leaf is a wine club that curates and ships wines that are perfect for you. And since they work with renowned winemakers from all over the world, there's virtually no limit to the variety of wine 
wines that you get to try. And when you rate the wine you receive, they learn more about your palate. So my shipments have gotten better and better over time as they learn about my preferences. I am having so much fun discovering all the different wines that I would have never known about in the first place, like all the different rosés out there. Join today and you'll get six bottles of wine for $29.95 and free shipping. Just go to tryfirstleaf.com slash dateable. That's six bottles of wine for $29.95 and free shipping at tryfirstleaf.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. This episode is brought to you by the book Dinner on Primrose Hill by New York Times and USA bestselling author Jody Thomas. This book takes readers to Clifton Bend, Texas, a small college town where two very different scientists, Benjamin Monroe and Virginia Clark, must team up on an experiment on the chemistry of mating. Sounds spicy already. Can these two opposites attract and quantify the science of love? Virginia knows her desire to work with Benjamin is motivated by more than just the potential of that prize money and hopes that he might not be as quite indifferent as he seems to be. And soon enough, their project, The Chemistry of Mating, is gaining notoriety. Friends, neighbors, the whole town has become involved. But no matter what the data determines, one conclusion seems inescapable. Love follows its own rules. You can get your hands on Dinner on Primrose Hill anywhere books are sold or at kensingtonbooks.com. Okay, let's hear it for Rob Mack, all about happiness. But we're going to get right into this conversation about happiness. And we have a happiness coach with us. I did not even know that that (laughs) could be a career path. And I think it's the most incredible career path. And at the end of the day, on our podcast, anything we talk about, it all is geared towards the goal of happiness. Everybody just wants to be happy, right? There's Mm -hmm. there's nobody out there that's like raising their hand saying, no, I'd rather be emo all my life. (laughs) So outside of everything that's expected of us when it comes to dating, relationships, and marriage, ultimately, we're looking for our person. And some of us believe that our person will also make us happy. So Mm -hmm. we can debate that a little bit later if we want to. But we are talking to Rob Mack. He's a positive psychology expert, celebrity happy happiness coach, executive coach, and author of the book, Happiness from the Inside Out. Hi, Rob. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're Thanks so excited. <laughs> I'm just happy seeing your face because exactly. you have such a big smile. Uh, <laughs> who is Rob? He's 40 years old. He lives in LA and Miami, originally from Pennsylvania, single and actively going on happy dates. <laughs> <laughs> Only happy Love dates, that. of course. <laughs> I had to, happiness and happy are words that are thrown around a lot. And I actually had to look up the definition because what is the definition of happiness? Happiness is a feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. What a crazy definition. Or fortunate and convenient is another definition of happiness. This is not good definitions. It does not even do the word any justice. So Rob, how would you describe or define what happiness is? I would say that happiness is peaceful aliveness, right? So Mm. it's the experience of peaceful aliveness that underlies all experiences, conditions, circumstances, thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions, um, all of that. And so I'd say that happiness isn't just what you do or what you feel or what you think. Happiness is essentially what you are. Mm, yeah. I like that. So that can feel a little abstract and esoteric for folks, I think. But yeah, it's sort of the very essence and very core of who and what you are. And so another word for happiness is simply peace mm. or life peacefulness. Mm. But it's definitely a piece that feels alive. Mm, I like that better than contentment. Yeah, I think a lot of um, us probably think of happiness or experience it as something that can sometimes feel a little saccharine, right? It feels a little inauthentic or it feels like it's just about this emotional roller coaster that we take and experience. So it's a high of some kind. It's an emotional high. Um, or we might associate it with pleasure. You know, happiness is pleasurable, but it doesn't equate to pleasure, right? Mm-hmm. Happiness feels good. Um, but it's all, not only good feelings, you know, there's a, there's a deeper felt sense of peaceful aliveness that's lasting, meaningful, and abiding that mm. underscores and underlies all experiences. But that's not something I knew at the beginning of my happiness journey. So that brings us to a good question because I'm dying to know. What got you into like mm-hmm. kind of the happiness industry? Were you always yeah. just happy-go-lucky or what was your story? I was suicidal, believe it or not. So I am oh the my least God. likely person to be a happiness coach. I mean, I feel like I was born unhappy. I was deeply depressed. Mm. 
and stressed out, anxious, self-loathing, self-hating, insecure. I thought I would grow out of it. You know, I thought, oh, I'll do okay, maybe hopefully academically, athletically, socially, eventually mm-hmm. financially. And all of that happened. You know, I did do pretty well in the sports field. I did well in the classroom. I eventually had some friends. I had a girlfriend. I had a great consulting job. But dysphoria, which really became depression, eventually got worse and worse. And I eventually got to a place where I was seriously suicidal. So I was experiencing Mm. suicidal ideation dozens of times a day. And so I got to a place where I decided I was going to do some research. And so I looked for means or a method to kill myself that I had access to. I didn't feel too violent, decided I was going to slash my wrist. So mm. went to the kitchen, got a kitchen knife, dug into my wrist, still have the suicide test marks there on my wrist wow. to this day. But something very strange and unpredictable happened in the middle of that experience, which is that for no good reason, without the external conditions or circumstances of my life changing at all, I mean, I had a pretty good life externally, objectively. Mm-hmm. On the inside, I just felt this sense of peace and joy and inexplicable love that I hadn't mm. really ever experienced before. So in that moment, I decided I was going to postpone suicide for just like 15 minutes. Like <laughs> it wasn't very long, you know, even that felt like a very tall, vicious order. And it felt nearly impossible to wait that long. But I did some research in that period of time. And before long, I discovered most importantly that I wasn't alone and that there were mm. some people out there that were much wiser and maybe smarter than me that had figured out a way out. Of mm. it. So yeah. you could come back from it, you've realized. How yeah. old were you? Um, I was in my early 20s. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. that's quite the story. I've been reading a lot recently about how when we are in the womb, we're the happiest. All of our needs are taken care of. You don't feel alone because you're tethered to another human being. And once we come out of the womb, we spend our lifetime chasing that feeling again. And I can definitely attest to the fact that I've been there as well. And it's a very dark place to be. And to feel that loneliness is absolutely profound. So it's an incredible story. Thank you so much for for telling us that. And what about your current clients who come to you for happiness coaching, I guess you could call it? Are they also in a similar spot? Um, Some of them are. Lots of them aren't, but they all share this roller coaster ride that is life. And so they experience the ups and the downs. And most of them, I would say without Mm -hmm. question, want to experience more ups than downs, Mm -hmm. right? But not all of them are suicidal or depressed by a long stretch, but lots of them, all of them are very familiar with stress and anxiety and insecurity and frustration, overwhelm, right? So yeah, I mean, I think to, to be alive is to, I think, recognize and experience the frustration often of dealing with and navigating life. And that's what they all share in common. Well, I think one of the reasons why dating can be so difficult is that it shines a light to all of that. Mm -hmm. It's not really just about, you know, meeting other people. It's about really getting up with all your insecurities and fears and all the deep stuff that we've been suppressing for years. Like, how do you see, you know, clients come to you in regards to dating with happiness? Such a great question, Julie. I mean, I initially set out to be a happiness coach, mostly because I was trying to be happy myself. And so I didn't decide I was going to be a happiness coach. I just wanted to be happy. And then over mm-hmm. time, people noticed that no matter what I was up to, I was always carrying around my like, don't kill yourself books. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I was keeping my little journal about, you know, I was tracking the happiness activities that were working and the ones that weren't. And so I always thought, well, maybe I'll help people by becoming a happiness coach. But interestingly enough, most people, even to this day, that reach out to me, reach out because they're having relationship problems or dating problems of some mm-hmm. kind, right? And so most of us associate or confound happiness with relationship problems or with relationship fulfillment in some, in some way. So I'd say that most all of the people that I talk to are mostly frustrated by other people or the lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right, yeah. right. Interesting. So how do you help people relinquish that control where people feel like my happiness is dependent on finding someone else or dependent on someone else's behavior? How do you change their mindset? Yeah. So it's such a great question. You, I mean, I think first and foremost, we just start with the data points we've already all gathered. So if you look into the past, look into your life, notice how many things you've prayed for or hoped for or set intentions around or visualized or wanted that you now have. And then notice how you're no happier as a result of that. In fact, to a large extent, lots of people are much less happy as a result Mm -hmm. of 
all these realized mm-hmm. goals and dreams and desires. And so just recognizing that alone, that there's no amount of money, no amount or degree of youth or beauty that will ultimately lead you to living a happy life in a lasting, meaningful and abiding way. Just recognizing that alone, I think is pretty convincing. But then there's the piece around science as well, right? We have lots of scientific data at this point, at least over two decades worth, you know, from places like University of Pennsylvania and Harvard and Claremont and University of Michigan. And, you know, all that science basically says that no successful condition or combination of successful conditions will ever guarantee you happiness. In fact, there's a formula, a happiness formula, and we know that only about 10% of your happiness is attributable to conditions. So mm. circumstances, conditions at all, 10%. And that's best case mm. scenario. So imagine your most perfect and ideal life, whatever wow. it is, right? Whatever that is, would only account for 10% of how happy or unhappy you are. And what's the other 90%? Yeah. So the other 90% is perfectly malleable. 50% is actually genetic. So mm. we're all wired, wow. yes, for more or less happiness. But that genetic component is itself changeable and plastic, which means that it's not like height or eye color that you mm-hmm. can't really change, right? It's something that's completely changeable and you can change it by the people that you hang out with and exercises, activities that you participate in, foods you eat, all that good stuff. Um, so that's 50%. The other 40% is the voluntary stuff, right? So it's the choices you make around gratitude and again, the people you hang out with and all that good stuff. So really 90% perfectly within your control. And I'd argue that 10% also a lot more within our control than we realized if we're going to spend our time, energy, and very precious life on this planet, Mm -hmm. trying to be happy. We don't want to spend it all or most of it just trying to rearrange or organize the sort of decks on the Titanic. So would would you say it's fair to say that 90% is just mindset, like how you view your current situation, or is it a little more complex than that? Uh, I'd say that's a great way of describing it um, in a very simple way. I'd say okay. at the end of the day, it's, it's, we can think about it in a number of ways. One is um, happiness is what you do. So in mm. the beginning of our journey, it's like if you're doing things that make you miserable, that aren't a good fit for you, and you're pursuing right. a career that is just not a good match or in alignment with your personality or signature strengths, you're going to find it hard to be happy, right? So happiness is definitely about doing happy things, if at all possible. But then the second level is it's also about spending time with happy people or supportive people, loving people, encouraging people, healthy people, right? So there's that piece of it. But then the third level is definitely really about entertaining or at least exploring better feeling stories about your life and about the world in general, but in a way that's still true. So that is about Mm -hmm. mindset, right? So it's about optimism and about gratitude and about hope, no question about it. But there's a fourth level and generally science doesn't talk too much about this, but It's not just about happiness producing activities and happiness supporting individuals and people in your life and about happy thoughts. It's also about no thoughts, right? There are periods in our life Mm -hmm. or day where we're not thinking at all. And if you notice more and more of those periods of no mind or no thought, you'll see how you're already perfectly at peace and happy Mm. already without having to do any of the other things. I don't know if I ever have a moment where I don't have any thoughts. This is why I'm so bad at meditation. And this is probably why I should take up meditation. I don't know, exactly. Julie, are you the same? It's, like, my mind is always racing. No, it's always the people that can't do meditation that should be doing meditation. <laughs> That's right. It's kind of like lifting weights. It's like, you know, we can say, yeah. oh, I can't lift that five pounds. But the only reason we can't lift that five pounds is because we haven't tried lifting that five pounds often enough. Right, right, right. So, and, and the other thing just to say real quickly is that All of us have gaps in our thoughts all day long, but we don't notice them. We usually rush past them, Mm -hmm. you know, too quickly. So when you're experiencing tremendous pain or tremendous pleasure, there often is just a moment or a micro moment when your mind is perfectly still and quiet. And if you were to notice those gaps in the traffic of your mind more consistently, you would quickly discover that the gaps widen and they also become more frequent. And um, in those gaps is essentially, you know, these pregnant pauses and those pregnant pauses are really full of like, we'll call it a bundle of joy, but it's happiness. So we hear people all the time that's like, once I'm in a relationship, I'll be happy. Or Mm -hmm. once I'm married, I'll be happy. Or once I have kids, I'll be happy. Would you put that in like the 10% that's more circumstance? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, really, when you think about it, anything that you imagine will make you happy in the future, while it seems like an opportunity to be happy later, is really mostly an obstacle to being happy right now. So Mm. any of those if-then statements generally are a good indication that you're placing your happiness in the future in somebody or something else other than yourself. Mm. And that is the primary cause of your unhappiness. 
itself. Right. So what about people that are single that just hate being single? Like how can you feel like happy in your current life stage or your situation or, you know, whatever it is, whatever stage you don't want to be in essentially? Yeah. I'd say the first thing is try to take your power back and stop, if you can, outsourcing what you feel to anybody or anything else or the lack of anything or anybody else. And one way to do it simply is just to Create a list called your happiness islands. Those are things, people, places that allow you to feel inspired, energized, uplifted, happy for no good reason, just for their own sake. And do what you can to spend more time with those people, activities, people, you know, in in places. Also, notice the things that make you feel really miserable or drained for no good reason. We call those your happiness deserts. And do everything you can to spend less time with those people, activities, and places, right? And so that's a good first step is just to begin to notice all of the incredible reasons that you have to be happy today, despite not having a partner or relationship. Mm. Do you believe that happiness can be addictive, that people want to keep chasing it, but for the wrong reasons? And I ask this because I feel like once I feel happy, I want to constantly feel that feeling. So I'm chasing after people, things to make me feel that again, but that's not realistic. Well, yeah, I mean, and you bring up such a great question. You know, I love it so much. I mean, we become addicted to pleasure. What, what, you know, Happiness, mm. um, I would say we're not addicted to only because it's something that is within us and that is essentially us. And so it's instead, I would say, you know, again, happiness is what you are. If you find yourself chasing a high of any kind, um, that's fine. You know, don't judge yourself for it, but also realize and recognize that that's not happiness. Like anticipation or pleasure Mm. isn't happiness. Happiness is pleasurable and it can be full of anticipation, but it's not the same thing. Okay, light bulb moment. I just want to repeat what you just said. Happiness (laughs) is what you are. So it's a state of being and pleasure are those spikes and those are the highs that people chase after. But happiness is accessible anytime, anywhere right now. You just nailed it. Beautifully said. I mean, really beautifully said. It's like, yes, happiness is, it's not a lifestyle status. It's not even a state of emotion or a state of mood, which is what most of us assume. It's a state of being. It's not even a state of mind, although a state of mind will kind of lead you there a little, right? It's a state of no mind. It's a state of being itself. And that state of being, you can kind of think of like when you go to a movie, you go to a movie, watch a movie. And the movie, we get all caught up in the characters and the action. It's so fun to watch. It's all scary to watch. And then it's sexy and then it's gross. And we experience all the emotions. And the one thing that we don't really recognize or really remember very often is that it's all happening on this screen. That screen that basically absorbs or allows you to see the images on the screen, that screen itself is immovable, unshakable, and indestructible. And it's perfect peace, okay? That mm-hmm. screen. And no matter what happens on the screen, it's untouched really by what happens on the screen. That's That screen itself is what I would describe as happiness itself. And that screen is inside of you. And so no matter what happens on the surface of your life, the conditions, the circumstances, the thoughts, and the emotions, underneath it all, if you dive deep enough, you'd realize that that screen, this perfect, peaceful aliveness always exists within you. And you can access that and experience that even as you experience the other things. And you can kind of bring that screen to the forefront of your experience of life instead of letting it always be in the background somewhere. Um, But Mm. essentially what happens to most of us is we forget that we're watching a movie essentially. And we get so caught up in all the action and all the drama and we go chasing, you Uh know, and we don't really spend enough time just basically being. Well, I think what you said, like the addicted to addicted to pleasure, not happiness is interesting because I can see why people now tie happiness to relationships Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of pleasure, you know, when things are going good, it's good. You mentioned your clients a lot of times come to you with relationships when they're unhappy or they're happy. Why do you think this is such at the forefront of people's perception of happiness? Yeah, well, it's, it's um, sort of easy to forget that you are happiness and then to go seeking for that which you are without realizing it or recognizing, right? So another way to say that essentially is that, you know, we seek in, in our illusory or erroneous perception or belief that we're, that we're half of a person or just part of a person, that we're not whole, that there's mm-hmm. something lacking or missing in our lives. We go to yeah. fill that up with something, anything. And usually, you know, another person just seems so, it's like it's such a seductive idea. It's like, why not be with somebody else? Why not be in a relationship? It just sounds fantastic. But if you look real closely, you'll notice that the challenge is that we haven't really come to enjoy or love our own aloneness. And we haven't 
dive deep enough within ourselves to discover that whatever it is we're looking for another person, we already have within ourselves, right? So even the experience of love, like I don't need a partner to feel love. You know, mm-hmm. I don't right, I don't need a partner to feel happiness. And in fact, sometimes having a partner is the one thing that gets in the way of you feeling the love that's inherently and intrinsically yeah. inside you or the happiness that's inside you or the peace that's inside of you. And so, you know, it's understandable and we all have done it and we'll all continue to do it. We forget for a period of time that what we're looking for is not only within us, but is us. This is also where the science helps out a lot. With, you know, science has basically found that happy people essentially have better relationships of all kinds. Either. They have happier relationships of all kinds, which makes sense. They also get married earlier, stay married longer, and are happier in all the relationships, whether they're married or not. They also, by the way, are rated as more attractive than their unhappy counterparts. And it's not because they're actually physically more attractive. It's that mm-hmm. happiness itself is attractive, right. literally and figuratively. Right. Yes. So yes. the challenge and opportunity is to find a way to be happy without a partner so that you can one day attract a partner more quickly and be happier in the relationships. Yes. Part. Absolutely. We actually had this really great quote that I want to read that it was the best advice I heard was to find someone who supports your happiness, not someone you need to depend on it. What are your thoughts about this quote? And like, how can people start looking more inward? I love that so much. I mean, Mm -hmm. I heard Warren Buffett say something really interesting one time. They asked him, what's the best piece of business advice you could possibly give? And he said, to make sure you're very selective and choosy about your partner, you know, that you're a romantic Mm -hmm. partner, you know, who you choose for a husband Mm -hmm. or a wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. I feel that so strongly because generally what happens in relationships is that we like to think that if we're happy enough, we can pull the other person up to our level of happiness. But that rarely, if ever happens, what mostly happens is that the least happy person brings you down to their level, right? And so the first thing is to recognize that happiness relationships aren't designed to make you happy. Right. That's they, like they, a big burst for they, people. They, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they can enhance your happiness. You know, if you're happy already, they mm-hmm. can enhance your happiness, but they're not designed to make you happy. They're designed to make you aware. And in your awareness, you can become happier, a lot happier. But that's the reason the challenge and the opportunity with relationships is not to look for happiness in them. Because again, you're outsourcing this thing that actually you are infinitely rich and wealthy in. Right. I think Sheryl Sandberg says something very similar also about, you know, the partner is your greatest indication of success is who you choose as a partner. And I think I saw like a study somewhere that the most happy people just overall, again, there's probably a lot of factors were people that were married in good relationships, what they consider good relationships. And then next was people that were single. And then at the bottom were people that were in relationships that were did not make them happy. It's so good, Julie. Like you're right, you know, so a lot of the science, what it essentially says is that let's take marriage as an example, but you could take any relationship really. So most of us assume you get in a relationship, you get married, of course I'm gonna be happier. I love this person. They're great to me, whatever. Right. They're great. But what happens with most people, um, almost everyone, is that you experience a small bump increase in your happiness when you first get married or get into that relationship. And then as soon as that honeymoon phase is over, you experience a decline and that Mm. happiness goes back to its original baseline level for a while. And then depending on whether or not you all get along very well, it will either, you know, stay at the baseline level or dip way below that. Right. And so the one, one of the key, you know, sort of factors in a happy relationship is of course, is two happy, independent, like independently happy individuals. Mm -hmm. That's critical. The other thing is that it's the relationships where each partner sees the other in really positive light. And so they Mm -hmm. generally see that we call it positive illusion, but they see their partner, each of them sees the other in a way that is better than that person's five best friends, right? Mm -hmm. So they see them in a positive light. And so it's interesting. So entertaining this positive, we'll call it illusion, but for them it's reality. Entertaining that positive illusion about the other is extraordinarily helpful in you having a happy relationship. Oh, Does that, make that sense? is so interesting. Yeah. That is very interesting. Okay, let's hold that thought as we go into a few messages. Support for Datable is brought to you by Incipio. Incipio offers legendary protection for all of your devices from phones to AirPods to tablets. They obsess over their tech to protect yours. It's like Incipio's line of products was made for me because with their phone cases, my phone is protected from drops as high as 14 feet. The cases are also wireless charging compatible and there's a lifetime warranty. So they've got you covered. I have the Organic Core Clear Case, which is made up of 100% compatible compostable materials that reduces landfill waste by naturally re-entering the environment from where it started. All the packaging is made out of 100% recyclable materials with eco-friendly water-based ink. Now for Datable listeners only, we have a special offer. These incredible cases are now available for purchase at incipio.com and you can use 
use the code DATEABLE for 20% off. That's I-N-C-I-P-I-O dot com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E for 20% off. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATEABLE at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over for $60. So head to OSEAMalibu.com and use the code DATEABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. This episode is made possible by Armoire. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out. Listen, I live in Southern California. There is absolutely no need for puffer coats or any sort of those winter jackets. But when I travel anywhere else in the world in these cold months, I'm often burdened with the task of getting winter clothes. And now with Armoire, I can just rent my winter wardrobe. It's brilliant. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash datable. That is armoire.style spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try Armoire today. And for all the people who are not in relationships in those early stages of dating, and as you know, Rob, you're also dating, uh, what, what are some ways people can stay present and not let these bad actors <laughs> destroy their happiness you know the the ghosting breadcrumbing not right. texting back how how can people still stay grounded in their happiness during early dating yeah i think it's um number one prioritize happiness above everything and everybody else mm-hmm. just realize that happiness makes your life better in all ways first of all it's like mm-hmm. happy people make more money than unhappy people 600 to 700 thousand dollars more on average over the course of their entire lifetime. As we mentioned before, they get married earlier, stay married longer, are happier in all the relationships no matter what. They're healthier, they live 67 years longer. So just prioritizing happiness is like a cheat code. It's like a master code to experiencing successful outcomes, particularly in relationships. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two then is also taking responsibility for your own happiness and not outsourcing it to other people or things. You know, it's like cut out all the middle men and middle women and realize and recognize that nobody can make, and nothing can make you feel anything without your own consent, right? And so take your power back in that way. So that's number two. Number three is then to make sure that you're focusing on enjoyment, that no matter where you are or who you're with, make the best of it, you know, make a decision that you're gonna make the best of it. And as hard as it is, and we know that you didn't choose the bad or undesirable person or circumstances, do what you can to still make the most of it. And so one way to say that is just learn to be more and more present, right? If you can learn to be more present and learn to make this moment matter by enjoying it as deeply as humanly possible, you'd be surprised how much better everything else goes. So mm-hmm. we have daters out there that just hate dating apps. They despise using them and they yep. despise the dating process. There was uh, one person in our community that posted this great article about how it's not being single that's hard. It's dating that's hard. But ultimately, a lot of the people want to find their person at some point. How do you, because I know you mentioned earlier, like part of happiness is doing things that make you happy. How do you navigate this if you fundamentally aren't enjoying the process? Yeah. So I would strongly encourage you not to do anything that's not fun or that you can't make fun or you can at least accept in a sort of neutral way. That's number one. I mean, that's most unhappy journeys don't end happily. 
you know, unfortunately, that's kind of what the science is saying to us. Okay. So I would not encourage you to continue your dating apps if you absolutely hate them because you're going to pollute the entire space and all of your dates with that negative energy, right? So that's number one. I would say, um, you know, second, look for those place, sort of spaces and places that you can both enjoy life and also enjoy people. You know, it's like, if you can't enjoy people, how can you possibly enjoy dating? How can yeah. you enjoy romantic, you know, experiences mm-hmm. with other people? You really want to practice enjoying moments and enjoying people as much as humanly possible without an expectation of where it's going to lead sometime in the future, right? So that can be a little challenging, I know. But the whole idea here is kind of like, if you don't enjoy your own company, how the heck can I? How the heck can anybody mm-hmm. else? It's like, you have to be able to learn how to enjoy your own aloneness or your own company in order to enjoy togetherness in somebody else's company. You can't enjoy your own. You can't ask anybody else to do what you can't do yourself. So were you saying, let me know if I'm interpreting this correctly, like if you're bitching about the dating apps or whatever it is, it's usually deeper than that. It's usually something oh, within yourself. Um, it, yeah, possibly. I would say, I would say that, you know, the dating apps can be really, I get it, problematic. It can feel like, it can feel inquisitive. It can feel like you're just collecting people, you know, it can feel like very mm-hmm, transactional yep. and, and I get all of that. And so I'd say if it's a largely negative experience for you, don't use the dating apps, meet people in person. Like that's still a thing. I meet people, so many people in person, not just people I want to date all the time. Even, even now where we are, you know, in this time with, you know, the, the things going on with COVID, it's pretty incredible how much people enjoy and want to meet each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, try not to do anything you hate. That's first. (laughs) Okay. I would say then if you, no matter what it is you do, try your best to enjoy it. I think what helps me to enjoy things more and more is remember, I'm not going to live forever. Like it's a very short life. Right. And I don't know how short it is. I might not have another moment. I might not have another hour. So I don't want to continue postponing and procrastinating on this love thing and this happiness thing until just the right person shows up at the right, just the right way and does just the right thing or says just the right thing to me. It doesn't make any sense. Right. So I would say be a little less patient, you mm-hmm. know, and do your best to make now matter. There is this other argument that happiness is only felt when you've experienced the opposite, mm. right? People who feel yeah. like, oh, I when I go through sadness, I can really appreciate the happiness. What is your opinion about that? Is that something that we should take as the truth? So it is true that contrast can make life really beautiful. It's the sour that makes the sweet that much sweeter. And so there's no question about that. And that also is, um, we call it duality, right? Mm-hmm. So the world we live in is duality. It's like, how do we know off without on? How do we know black mm-hmm. without white? You know, it's kind of difficult to kind of know these things or have these experiences. And that being said, the happiness I'm talking about is really a non-dual experience. And so mm-hmm. anything that you perceive or sense or think through the mind is going to always be full of these opposites, like this yin and this yang. And it's great. And it's beautiful. And like, enjoy it all. No question about it. But I would say that happiness, again, is different from pleasure, which is always counterbalanced by pain. And it's even mm. not, I wouldn't even call it the opposite of unhappiness. The happiness I'm talking about is something that is, it, it has no opposite. It's the very ground of your being, right? So some people might even refer to it as God or consciousness itself or awareness itself. Again, just words. But you're absolutely right in the sense that tough things can make good things feel that much better. And mm-hmm. adversity can play an incredibly important role in our lives because it helps us appreciate things that we didn't appreciate before or as much before. It helps us prioritize relationships. So yes, you'll definitely want to do what you can to appreciate the adversity and the contrast in your life. But also, please try to explore this idea, really this experience, that happiness is something that transcends duality. It's something that exists as the very ground of your being. Fascinating. Fascinating. So I feel like you and I are real big proponents of mindset, like kind of what you were just saying around, you know, how do you start to see things in a different way? And I guess my question for you is, do you think that's the key to finding happiness? Or do you think there's other tools and techniques that you've used along the way? Yeah, there's so many tools. And I mean, there's so many exercises, I would say they kind of fall into like, um, I guess they're four buckets, but I'm sure we could break it down into a thousand buckets. But I would say, <laughs> you know, the one is just, you, you basically have full, four tools at your disposal. It's like actions that you take. Okay. So you want to do everything you can mm-hmm. to try to take the happier actions. Okay. And sometimes you can't always tell what the happier action is until you've played it all the way out. It's like for lots right. of us, yep. drinking a lot of alcohol all the time feels like a great idea. But then you have the hangover, <laughs> right? Then you have the hangover. You're like, okay, that's not going to be a you know, activity that can do There's all the duality with that. Yes. There's <laughs> lots of duality, right? Um, so happy 
activities or actions. But then there's, you know, and happy people or loving people, supportive people. And then, there, but then there's, like you said, happy sort of mindset. We'll call it that. And so that's all about telling a better feeling story based in truth about everything in your life. So it's like, if you have zero dollars in your bank account, are you broke or is there only up from here, right? Or right, it's raining right. outside. Is it a bad day or is it simply raining, right? And it'll be sunny right. tomorrow, right? So mindset, absolutely. Now, that being said, that will take you but so far. It'll take you to the very edge, right where you can sort of begin to actually dive all the way into happiness. So the thing I discovered about, let's say, positive thinking, even the most positive thinking will not give you a perfectly positive life. There's still going to be this contrast, right. right? And if you notice underneath most positive thinking, there's still this level of anxiety, mm-hmm. just this low level of anxiety, which, right? And so it's kind of like still... It's better than negative thinking, way better, but it's still not quite it. And so you sort of take this leap. And this is where we get expressions like the peace, the path to understanding, right? Mm-hmm. Or the eternal sunshine of this spotless mind, right? It's a speaking to this happiness that exists as a state of no mind, as, as a state of no thought. And that's kind of where meditation comes in very handy or practicing the presence or all these other terms that some of these people use. But there is a happiness that can begin with happy activities and happy actions and then lead to happy people and also lead to happy mindsets. But then there's another step that you ultimately want to take that is beyond mindset. So baby steps first, <laughs> open that door or just, yes. I don't know, push it a little bit and then yes. eventually it'll fully open. Exactly. Exactly. And what you'll notice is that like that final step, like think about that moment right before you fall asleep at night, right? There's like, you're so tired. You don't want to move your body. You're so tired. You don't have many thoughts left. It's like right before you step off to sleep, like that one moment right before you, it's so blissful. That moment of no thought. You're not thinking anything. You're not doing anything. You're just so comfortable in your comforter and your pillows and all that mm-hmm. good stuff. And you're not really, and then you're sleeping. And then notice mm-hmm. for eight hours, maybe you dream a little bit, but you feel so refreshed in the morning. And mm-hmm. besides that dreaming part, most dreamless sleep is nothing but no thought, but it's right. so blissful. Right. So we all have that experience. In fact, we're more familiar with that experience than we are anything else. But our mind will convince us otherwise most days. Hmm. I guess the only kind of counter I'd have to that is sometimes when you're doing nothing, is that always the best state either? You know what I mean? Like if you're not taking any action, is that a good thing? Right. So here's the beautiful thing. And I love that point you make. So we sometimes think of being as opposite from doing. So it's like just do nothing. We think of it as the opposite of doing something. But, But I would argue that there's a way of being that includes doing, right? So it's mm. like it's like the runner who can run super fast, but inside, in their mind, in their heart, they're perfectly still. There's a relaxedness about it. They're, they're totally at ease, right? So we're talking about that. It's more like flow state. It's like- Flow state, yeah. Yes, say. right? It's possible to be totally at ease within your own skin, totally at ease with the world on the inside and not to be lost in discursive thinking and obsessive compulsive over analytical thinking and to just be on the inside or you take massive action on the outside, but your happiness doesn't depend on the ma- massive action you take. And it doesn't depend on the results of the massive action you take because you're still always resting inside. That's what we call resting in God, right? Or mm-hmm. resting in presence. It's taking action. Sure. Why not? But it's not being lost in the action. It's like being in the storm, but not letting the storm be in you. Mm. So you had this quote on Instagram again, that you don't have to seek happiness. You just have to stop seeking unhappiness. And I love that so much. I'd love for you to dive a little deeper in. But I think when I think of that quote is I think of people that are chasing situationships, for instance, that it's clear that's not bringing them happiness, yet they stick around or they're in a noticeably bad relationship. Why do you think one people do this and how can they stop seeking unhappiness? So great question. I mean, the first piece is, you know, the the brain, beautiful problem solving instrument is also a troublemaker. Okay. So the brain is built with all of (laughs) dozens of biases. Okay. And one of the major biases is a negativity bias, which means that the brain operates the way that a century of a ship does. Its job is to look for problems to solve and dangers to avoid, to keep you alive. So the Brain is built for survival, not necessarily happiness, although it does a pretty good job of that as well. And so what that means is that the problem always gets our attention. And so while we think, oh, there's an opportunity to be happy later, we've actually just identified a problem now, which is like we're lacking this thing. Maybe it's more money. Maybe it's a partner. Maybe it's a relationship. But the brain has this negativity bias. And so we're always up against this beautiful brain that loves solving problems, 
but also loves creating problems as much as it loves solving them, mm. right? So that's the first thing. It's kind of like this idea when, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when all you have is a brain, <laughs> everything looks like a problem to be solved. So uh. that's really the main sort of crux of what often leads us down passive sort of unhappiness. And if you look at the rest of nature, I mean, most of nature is perfectly blissful. Like only human beings make a problem out of their own existence. Like you ever think about yeah. that? Like only human beings really kill just to kill? Like because it's coming from like there's some unhappiness here or ang- like most animals in the you know animal kingdom, they, they, they kill to eat, but they don't just yeah, kill survival. to kill, right? Survival, right. right? Or whatever. And so just notice the ways in which, yes, we think we're so civilized as human beings, um, <laughs> but we're also, right? We also create a problem out of our own existence. And a lot of that is just, you know, we love the brain, but the prefrontal cortex. Well, the pro- the, also the problem with a lot of daters is that we think we know what we're looking for and we mm-hmm. think we know how to gauge if someone's a good partner. So even thinking about the traditional way of setting a barometer, you know, how you would evaluate someone as a partner, people always say, does he make you happy? Does she make you happy? And I think that is the wrong way of thinking about it because no person can ever make you happy. But I would ask, does this person take away from your happiness? Mm. So good. That's so good. That's so poignant and profound. That's exactly right. You know, it's like, are they supporting you in your happiness? Right? They can support you in it. But the greater question, the better question is, yeah, are they taking away from it? Right? Do you feel drained? You know, I mean, I think we've all had the experience where it's like, you love someone very much and you feel such relief when they're not around. Right? It's like, oh, I love this person, but they feel, I feel so stressed and anxious when they're around and I feel so much relief when they're not around. And so that's also a good sign. But yeah, I love that. I love exactly the way you framed it. Before. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think happiness needs to come from within 100%. But I do think being in a happy, healthy relationship, I use the word happy, but in a healthy relationship can make you happy. I, I feel it. Like, I guess, is there a counter of that? Like, why? I guess if we're really saying that it, relationships don't make you happy, why are we all chasing them? Yeah, so so I'll say this, and I love the point you're making. You know, relationships matter. Okay, there's, there's no question. Relationships matter. And when we look at the science, we know that relationships matter almost more than anything else in terms of happiness. The, 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 the difficulty and the challenge and the sort of misperception that we often have is that that social connection that you ultimately want to feel has to come or should come or best comes through a romantic relationship. Okay. Mm. I would say that friendship is one of the highest forms of relationship in my mind. Like kindness, mm. kindness is when I really mm-hmm. want to talk about love, I talk about kindness. Like kindness is the highest kind of love from my perspective. And if you think it only comes through or mostly comes through or has to exclusively come through a romantic partner, you're setting yourself up for a lifetime of challenges because it's like hoping that this one person will be this one-stop shop for all of your psychological, emotional, yeah. and spiritual needs. And that's right. a lot. To, that's a lot of pressure. That's a, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, um, and I would argue that it's impossible for anyone else to do that for us when we can't even, or we haven't even done that for ourselves, right? It's like most of us are asking others to do for us what we haven't been able to do for ourselves, which is like fully unconditionally love us. Like how many people Mm -hmm. have you met that have fully unconditionally loved themselves or even fully known themselves? And yet we're asking some stranger whom we haven't met yet to do (laughs) it, not just today, but forever. I love it. And I want you to experience all of that. I want all of us to experience all of that if that's our desire. But if I was placing bets, I wouldn't put my money on that. Well, Julie, I also have some thoughts about what you said, because I've been thinking about this too. Is it chicken or the egg? But I don't actually think it is chicken or the egg. I think we've been thinking about this backwards. When we've been in healthy relationships, we attribute it to our partner and our relationship. Mm. When if we really think about the root of it is because you were happy to begin with. So therefore you are able to recognize it's a healthy relationship. I know I've been in relationships where I was not at a state of happiness and I couldn't even recognize that it was a good relationship. I wasn't accepting of it. So I I think we're just, we tend to put so much pressure and I guess credit to relationships that we forgot that we are the instigator for how a relationship goes. Right. I love that. So it's like, yeah, like obviously the person has to be a good partner and contribute. They can't take away from it. But the reason you probably attracted that person in the first place is because you were in a good place. Exactly. Boom. Beautifully said. And if you think about it too, it's such a great point. And think about this. Let's say that any of us were in a very happy relationship and I would argue because we were happy ourselves and it was easy, it's easy to attract somebody, you know, happy when we're happy, happiness loves company, right? But also, you know, think about why or how that relationship didn't last. Now, why would that yeah. relationship that was so happy, why would it not last if this other person was the source of our happiness? It makes no sense. 
did they just stop deciding to provide the happiness that we are ultimately after? Or is there something else or more going on there? Right. And so that's, you know, some of the questions I ponder later. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the answer? <laughs> well, well, I would say that just the answer is that they're not the source of your happiness. I would say that yeah. most people are, you know, are, are trying hard, but most of us kind of suck at being happy. And we, and we certainly suck and making other people happy. We try hard, but we just don't always know where their itch is. Even when they tell right. us where their itch is, mm-hmm. we don't always know. And not just that, but most of us are wired for self-interest. We just are. Thank God. That lets us off the hook. That lets them off the hook. We want to be wired for self-interest because it means that we can just take care of ourselves and in our abundance and overflow, money or time or energy or whatever, we can share it with other people. And so we're just not wired to be anybody else's keeper in that specific way in terms of romantic relationship. Mm. What if you're just not in a happy place? Is it better to postpone dating and work on yourself? Mm. Or is it better to meet someone and continuously do the work? Because I feel like we we hear a lot of times like you need to work on yourself, but then you can also get into that endless cycle where you're never good enough, right? Yeah. So I would say this way, um, you know, I kind of sometimes say, you know, never go to the grocery store when you're hungry because you'll only basically buy and collect junk food. Junk food. Right? Uh Yep. And and never go to the dating pool when you're unhappy, right? Like Mm. that's generally going to also end up with some junk experiences and relationships. Now, challenge with that is some of us just feel like we have no other option or we're just so into it. We just have to do it no matter. And listen, that's perfectly fine too, because I promise you'll have enough experiences and you'll gather enough data points that will eventually lead you back to yourself. Okay. But I would say and argue, try not to go to the dating pool, you know, when you're unhappy. And instead, you really want to make this happiness thing priority, mm-hmm. almost a career, not like something you get paid for, but meaning that <laughs> it want, you want it to be the most important thing in your life because the only reason you want to date is because you want to feel better for having dated and for having been in a relationship and for having a partner. Yeah, You're ultimately after happiness. It's like no matter what you want right. to accomplish, acquire, achieve, you only want it because you think you'll feel better. That better feeling is what we call happiness. So instead mm-hmm. of just grounding it through all these different people and places and things, Just try to learn to go directly to the source for it. And then I promise if you can do this one thing, which feels so hard in the beginning, it will make everything else easy in the end. Everything else will become easier. Dating will become easier and making money will become easier and saving money will become easier and staying healthy will become easier. It all becomes easier if you tackle the real thing you're after and the real thing you want first. But most of us don't do that. We put the carpet for the horse and then we're like, you know, 110 years old and we're like, oh, (laughs) I only had to live my life happily. Yep. So well said. What about, I'm thinking of like maybe times when I wasn't as happy and like attracted certain things. I'm thinking of like kind of the up and down relationships, yes. the ones that have extreme highs and extreme lows. Maybe the ones that you break up and you get back together, uh-huh. you break up that, that shit storm. <laughs> can, <laughs> can, all in there. Can, yeah, we all have. Can, like, do you think that is a form of happiness when you're at the extreme high or is that just inevitably set up for? Yeah. Yeah, that, unhappiness. That's not. That's normally not a great sign. You know, no. I'm, it's, no, it's not a great sign. And I want to say that it is because it's gonna be so much fun. It's so exciting. Yeah. You know, but um, it sounds a little like emotional dysregulation on the part of mm-hmm. one or both people, right? It's two folks that you know may have not have learned or taught how to emotionally regulate themselves, right? And so they don't know how yeah. to self soothe. And so what that means is that it's like this ping pong pong ball effect. And so when you're mm-hmm. excited, now I'm excited. Now when you're sad, I'm sad. And it just kind of goes 55,000 different directions. So I would say that, no, that feels a little bit emotionally disordered to me. And that doesn't mean that your relationship shouldn't or can't have lots of highs. Generally speaking, I'd say that, you know, that's almost always a sign that <laughs> things are a little less peaceful than you might want. To. Yeah. <laughs> What about a less extreme version of that? Let's pare it down to, let's say, early stages of dating. Mm -hmm. You meet someone, think it's going pretty well. You're not getting the butterflies. We hear this a lot in our group. Mm -hmm. I don't feel butterflies around this person. I'm not super excited like I was with a previous person. In your personal opinion, which one should we go after? The one that feels steady and calm or the one that, that gives you butterflies? Yeah. So so I will say that um, it's such a great question and I cannot even pretend to have an answer on that. I, I would say I would say a couple of things. I would say I love the idea of both. I love the idea of, of feeling the butterflies, but still feeling really safe in the presence of uh, someone else mm-hmm, where safe. you know 
yeah, where like your self-esteem and all that doesn't feel like it's at stake all the time and, and your well-being right. doesn't feel like it's at stake and the person doesn't make you feel like they're going to just walk away at any point in time or whatever. You know, it's a more of a commitment there in terms of like caring about your psychological and emotional and spiritual well-being kind of thing, right? And that can feel like peace and yet you just can still have the butterflies because you're excited to see them. But so often butterflies, you know, part of it can be attracted, it's just attraction and part of it could be chemistry, right? Sometimes that doesn't feel like it has anything to do with attraction. It's like, why do I have chemistry with this person? I don't necessarily find them so so attractive or vice versa. I find them so attractive. There's no chemistry there. But then there's a third piece of this, which is a little bit more, I guess, concerning, which is like familiarity. So sometimes mm -hmm. the reason we feel the things we feel is because they consciously or subconsciously remind us of our parents, particularly mm -hmm. a parent that we had challenges with or a particular kind of challenge with. And so sometimes we mistake feeling butterflies for familiarity, you know, and so much of what happens in relationships is that without knowing it, it's like we're trying to heal things that happened in our childhood with our parents. Ugh, I know. Right. Right. I so, know. So sometimes the very person that you feel that with, yes, is the least last person you should be with. Rob, I heard this theory that the people who give you butterflies resemble your parents the most. That is the most sick, sick theory I've ever heard, but I believe it. I think it's true. It stems from that familiarity. It's pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, it is. You know, it's very Freudian. And, and I would argue that um, that doesn't have to be everyone. And I would say that the more work you've done to heal whatever unhealed stuff you've experienced in the past, like the more work you've done, the more confident you can be that when you feel the butterflies, it's not about that, right? It's not yeah, about right, that anymore. Right. So that's the question. If you haven't done any work at all, then yeah, probably really strong sign that there's some, you know, associations here with your parents and you probably need to look into that a little bit. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy it, but generally those things don't always, you know, go perfectly well. Mm -hmm. So I love this, like, let's not chase things that make us unhappy. But what about those times that inevitably do? Let's say you break up with a partner or you were really excited about someone and then they ghosted you. It's almost natural to feel unhappy. Are there ways that you can kind of get out of that and start to get happy again? Like, what are some tactics for those situations? Absolutely. Yeah. So first part is to accept and acknowledge what you feel and to feel what you feel all the way through. So lots of us try to run from what we're feeling or deny what we're feeling. And that doesn't work. It's like a cancer that just you know, sort of continues to grow right under your nose. So instead, you, you want to feel what you're feeling. If you're feeling grief or you're mourning or you're sad or you're feeling insecure, just notice what you're feeling. But instead of feeding what you're feeling with thoughts and with rumination, mm -hmm. self-rumination particularly, is which, which is what most of us do. We think that we're processing, but we're mostly just self-ruminating. Or we think we're yeah. reflecting, mm -hmm. but we're totally. just really self-ruminating. And that self-rumination and that sort of discursive thought is just feeding and fueling the very pain that you're experiencing. And so it lasts longer than it normally would. And so instead of going to the brain, you want to go to the body. Where do I feel this sadness, this anxiety, this overwhelm? this disappointment, this loneliness, what do I feel in my body? And then feel into that place in your body, okay? And then when a thought occurs or surfaces, you notice the thought without judgment, and then just let it go and come back to the body. And if you want, you can make, this is why meditation doesn't have to call it meditation. I don't like using that word too often. People get like, you know, scared away. But the idea essentially is just noticing what you feel and what you think without feeding it, without judging it, and just being with it, right? And that doesn't mean you can also swiffer. You can also do your work, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean that you have to totally stop living, but it just means, you know, spend a little time noticing what you're feeling and allowing yourself to feel what you feel. And I promise if you don't feed it by continuing to think about it or reliving it or pre-living it, which is what so many of us do. It's like this thing happened and now I'm going to relive it over and over and over again and re-traumatize myself a thousand times, or I'm going to pre-live it. I'm going to pre-traumatize myself a thousand more times because I'm afraid it's going to happen in the future. If you don't do that, you'd be surprised at how quickly those negative, unhealthy, unhappy sort of thoughts and emotions start leaving you alone. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a really great tip. And I was going to ask you for another tip. If we're doing like a quick start guide to mm -hmm. reconnecting to your happiness. What is something that our listeners can do today? Something simple yeah. to start opening that door. Yeah. So I would say I'm going to give you like four or five real quick. I'll be oh, great right. about it. Yeah, Even better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say like, bonus. Awesome. Yeah. Um, number one is those happiness islands. Just create a list. Try to do more of those things. Schedule more of those happiness islands into your life. Those are things, mm. people, places, activities that uplift, inspire, energize you. For two, happiness deserts. Identify those people, places, activities, and things that drain you. That uh. Do everything you can to get those off your plate. That means outsource them, delegate, reduce them, eliminate, automate, or regulate them. 
In other words, find a way to get them off your plate if you can. Mm -hmm. Next thing is really look into your life. And this is kind of part of the first activity. Be clear. Those people who drain you, you want to do what you can to spend less time with them, or at least, you know, shorter periods of time. You maybe see them more frequently, but you know, shorter conversations, shorter interactions, you know, keep it short, short and sweet. And then spend more time with the people that uplift you, inspire you, support you, encourage you. Mm -hmm. Next thing is start telling better feeling stories about everything and everybody in your life, starting with yourself, no matter mm -hmm. what, right? Better feeling, but truthful stories. So we talked about a little bit like, if, you know, if you have zero dollars, you're not broke. It's only up from here, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's the idea. Next, I would say is, in, and particularly if you struggle with self-love, one of the best things you can do is keep a self-love journal. So every single day, just begin to bullet out two or three things or more that you genuinely like and appreciate about yourself. It can be anything. It just has to be truthful. Okay? And try to do that every day. The other thing I'll mention in terms of like the no thought thing, because I think that's where people get sort of stuck the most, yeah. is what I call micro meditations. So a micro meditation is just one breath. So I don't know if you've ever been to a meditation class, but it can feel torturous mm -hmm. and yes. super annoying. Like, yes. you know, if you've ever done it, it's like the last thing you want to do. But a micro meditation is one breath. And I discovered I could always do one breath. And in the one breath, all you're doing is you're pretending like this moment, no matter where you are or what you're doing or who you're with, is the last moment you have on the planet in your life wow. ever. So really be sincere about that. Like this could be the last moment I have. And so I'm going to milk or juice this one breath for as much joy as I can possibly get out of it. So I'm going to let all my thoughts go. I'm going to breathe from the stomach the nose from the stomach but all my thoughts go and just try to enjoy it if i've never enjoyed a breath before right so you want to do that as often you can remember throughout the day no matter what else you're doing that one activity exercise micro meditation has probably been more helpful to me than almost anything else i've done when i've been consistent with oh wow that's so powerful. I just did it. <laughs> I just did it. I love breath work, but I love the context you put around yeah. it. Mm. Like it's your last breath on earth, mm. so you better fucking do it right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is a great segue into takeaways. Uh, there's so many things to unpack here. I think, I mean, the first one, I think we've come to the consensus that romantic relationships are not the key to happiness. It is from within. That being said, though, I think human connection is essential in life. Like I I think humans are meant to connect with other people. And I think loneliness can be a major reason for unhappiness. So while I think the emphasis might not always have to be on romantic relationships, having relationships in your life is still very, very important. And that is a way that you can, you know, connect with others, but it should never be at the detriment of connecting with yourself. Mm -hmm. Love that. Beautiful. I think my other takeaway is this better feeling story. I love that. We always say positive mindset shift, and yeah. I like that too, but I feel like sometimes it feels a little intimidating. And I think at the crux of it, we're saying the same thing is this better feeling story. It's yeah. how can I spin it that I see the good in the situation? Like when we talk about dating apps, for instance, you can say, well, people flake on me all the time. Or you could say, I could meet someone I never met before, or I would have no access to. Mm -hmm. Both are true stories. We're not going to deny that people flake all the time. But what is it really serving you to fixate on that story versus the other true story that you could find a great connection here? So I mm -hmm. think rewiring it from that. And I think that that terminology, I love it so much, because like you said, it's, it's true. And when you believe it, then you'll start to see it's true. But it is true. It's not like a falsism. It's just choosing to find the more um, positive part of what's going on in your life. Love that. So love good. That. Yes. It's so magical to think about this because it's very similar to my takeaway, Julie, is there's a dotted line between illusion to reality. And you said this earlier, Rob, is what could be seem like an illusion, if you believe it, it is your reality. And I think telling yourself these better stories about your life, your your own self-love will turn that illusion into a reality. I really believe that happiness is our default setting and nobody can take it away from us, only yourself. So I think we need to have a little accountability with our own happiness that nobody else is causing our happiness mm -hmm. or unhappiness except for yourself. And because of that, we just got to scratch a little bit more to find that happiness, but it's there. It's like the first layer of our skin or whatever, whatever they call it in those skincare commercials. It's like just scratch the <laughs> surface and it's there. You've always had 
had it instead of delaying it into the future that you talked about earlier. It's don't postpone happiness. Don't give your future self so mm-hmm. much pressure to make your current self happy because that's not right. going to happen. It is forever accessible to you and tap into it whenever you want to. And there are some great tactics that Rob just told us about to tap into the happiness. Oof. You two are good. <laughs> you two are good. You're good. Really? Man. You know, it's not our You've first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this. That's right. I've done this before. I mean, I know you're obviously the happiness expert here, but is there any parting advice or words of wisdom that you would like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, I, um, I just keep it simple. I'd say, um, you know, think less, live more, think less, enjoy more, think less, love more. You know, you don't have to wait for a lover to love. You know, you don't have to wait mm, for a partner to love, to, to love. You know, you can love the cashier, you know, you can love the person <laughs> in the mirror. You know what I mean? You can. You can love the kitten. You can love the tree. Like you can love the sunset. Like just, you know, love. Don't wait to love. Don't procrastinate. Right. Don't hesitate. You know, don't postpone. Like love now, live now, mm-hmm. enjoy now. I love that so much. I mean, we always say that to people that are, you know, searching for love. It's you have love. You've been in relationships before. Even if you haven't been in a ton of romantic relationships, you have a family, you have friends. Those are all relationships. So everyone is capable of love and relationships, whether you're in a relationship or romantic relationship or not. So good. I love that. Beautifully said. Thousand percent. I'm gonna go and make my happiness island and happiness yeah, desert I'm do that list right now. now. I love it. I'm gonna do that with my partner and yeah, see if we too. have any overlapping <laughs> islands and deserts. And then we're gonna get to action on how to <laughs> deal with all of that and create more happiness for ourselves. Thank you so much, Rob, for being on our show. If people want to get to know you a little better and learn about your services, where can they find you? For sure. Um, You can find happiness from the inside out and love from the inside out soon at Barnes & Noble and Amazon and everywhere else great books are sold. You can find me at my website at (laughs) coachrobmacmack.com. And you can also find me on most all social media platforms, probably most consistently Instagram at robmacmack.official. Awesome. When does your next book come out? Uh, It's going to come out the end of this year. That's Okay. Open, fingers Ooh. crossed. It should be December. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Very exciting. Yay. We'll definitely promote it to our community as well. I'm sure they would I love to read that. So appreciate you all. <laughs> Truly appreciate you. <laughs> so for our listeners, there is a source of happiness for us, which is uh, <laughs> Apple Podcast Reviews. <laughs> if you can I give us. You were gonna say that. <laughs> well. Even though happiness is a default setting. We are happier (laughs) when you leave five stars and give us a nice sentence or two about why you love us. It absolutely increases our happiness meter. Just saying you are you are responsible for our (laughs) podcast happiness. We'll just put that on the table. You've been getting so creative with the reviews lately. (laughs) I just love them every time. My favorite part of the podcast. (laughs) So I'll I'll leave it at that. But yes, it does make us happier. And on that note, we will be wrapping up this episode. Stay Stay (laughs) dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us, we look at all those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Mm-hmm.